This is Fireside Chat, episode 54. Johnny Hockey made the team. Recorded October 6th, 2014. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're less than 48 hours away from the start of the regular season, and it's Dan and Matt back with you. I'm Dan Stevenson, alongside my co-host Matt DeBorg. How you doing, Matt? I'm good as always. Ready for the season to get started? Oh, definitely. Does it seem like training camp has been a longer training camp? This, I mean, I know days-wise it's been the same, but to me it seems like there's been a longer camp and a lot more news this year. Does it feel that way to you? Yeah, and that's due in large part to the amount of players and prospects coming up that actually looks good out there for a change. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there's been, I went back and looked, there's been a lot more cuts than usual. And I think every time we've had a round of cuts, it's generated a lot more news. So I think it's made camp seem longer. Mm hmm. Usually after the first three or four games of training camp, like it's pretty much the opening day roster, but we had players still here right through to the last game. So it's a bit of a different spin on things. Well, let's get started by talking about some of the final moves at camp. On the last two episodes, we've talked a lot about uh, the training camp. Um, big news that came out today, well, I guess relatively big news. The Flames finally locked up Rafael Diaz, who is here on a tryout agreement. Um, they've signed him to a one-year deal worth estimated 700 k is what's being reported. So I think you and I both thought that Diaz would be the seventh defenseman, and to me, that's a great price for a seventh defenseman with NHL experience. Oh yes, definitely, and if he can provide anything positive moving forward, that's great. Yeah, I think, you know, Diaz had a weird season last year, he underperformed, he's only 28 years old, so he's still a fairly young guy, and I think, you know, he bounced around the league last year, but for 700000 he's not going to be expected to contribute a lot as a seventh guy, and I th- I'm hoping that he'll be one of the guys that pleasantly surprises us this year. Yeah, and if he can be a step up on uh, Derek Smith from last year, then it's a net gain. Yeah, or even, I mean, looking at the guy that's no longer in the lineup from last year, which is Chris Butler, I think, you know, that's probably a better comparison because Butler was an NHL player full-time last year. Yeah. So I'm happy with that. I uh, predicted last week that Diaz would be our seventh defenseman. Um, speaking of which, we talked last week that the Flames were going to pick somebody up off waivers, we predicted, from the guys that were on waivers. N- the Flames picked up nobody, and none of them got taken by anyone. Did that surprise you? Yeah, a little bit, but I can understand why they didn't. It would have been a good opportunity to get a free asset, though, but I can see why they didn't. They likely did not, uh figure that the other teams would have let go of those players if there wasn't something wrong with them developmentally wise so yeah i mean it's not like we needed that player and it's not like it was a big name from waivers and i'm still of the belief that i think we will end up acquiring somebody from waivers in the next week or so here as teams are starting to finalize and cut down to their uh opening day rosters i think there's going to be some decent talent available yeah, there usually is every year, yeah, especially with rookies that aren't quite good enough and they might try to sneak them through. So just have to keep an eye on that. Along with our signing of Diaz, um, the Flames announced today that Tyler Watherspoon was reassigned to the AHL. Watherspoon, I think he's been injured all training camp, hasn't he? Yeah, I don't think he played any games. Yeah, he had a shoulder injury, and so they send him down to the AHL. Which, looking at our defensive depth, I'd rather not carry Watherspoon as a number eight defenseman. I'd rather send him down to Adirondack and let him get some actual play time there. So I think that's a great move. Yeah, and looking at uh, most of the players that have been cut, it it's better for them to have top-line experience in the AHL than getting press box time up here. I think that's the thing a lot of Flames fans are not really thinking about. I'm hearing a lot of people say, oh, well, they're sending all the kids down. And you're absolutely right. I think we have to look at this realistically. And we could have a roster full of young players if we wanted it. 
but then somebody's not getting the playing time they deserve. I would rather have a makeup like it looks like the Flames are going to have for opening day where bring up a young player if there's a spot for them and they'll get play time. If not, send them to the AHL and let them get, you know, all the playing time they can there and bring them up and down as needed. Yeah, well, like, say Sven Berchi, he's going to get 20 minutes a night plus in the AHL. Up here, he might only get fourth line minutes. Well, would you rather have them getting seven minutes a night up here or 20 minutes down there? Like, you know, it, you need time to work out the little flaws and hiccups in your game, and ice time is the best cure for that. Yeah, well, and that's a good point. So let's talk about those final cuts then. So the Flames made their, I guess, their final cuts, if you will, um, yesterday. Watherspoon was sent to the AHL today on Monday. On Sunday, they sent down Sven Berchi, Yoni Ordeo, and Josh Juris. And when I saw the list, I had to kind of pause for a minute. When I look at the list of kind of guys that were on the bubble, guys I didn't expect to make it, I did not expect Josh Juris to be the last cut from camp. What about you? No, but that's a testament to how well he played. And that's good for him. And it it's always good to have surprises in training camp. Oh, and for sure. It, it helps move a rebuild forward when you have an unexpected guy like Josh Juris come out and say, look at me, I'm a good player. And whether he continues on and becomes an NHL player, that's up to him. But it's encouraging to see him being the last cut. Yeah, it is. And don't get me wrong, I was surprised he was there, but it's not like I'm disappointed. I'm with you. I love to see guys that step up and show us something we didn't expect from them. And even if the Flames don't think he's going to keep it up or we see signs during the year that he's not, he may have just made himself more valuable on the open market because of it. Exactly. And I would rather have guys like Jura step up than guys like Kundari and Hanowski who kind of waffled a bit during the preseason. I think, too, a guy like Josh Juris, to see him come in and play that way. Now, I haven't talked to Josh. I don't know anything about his his off-season regime or anything, or his off-season you know, training regimen or anything like that. But I think for a guy like that to come to camp so focused and so different from what we saw last year tells you there's optimism among some of these bubble players that, A, there's a spot for them, and B, that the Flames organization is the right fit for them. Yeah, and if they keep it up and keep pushing in Adirondack, they will get spots, just not quite yet. So, it's encouraging to see. It is. So I expected Ordeo to go down to Adirondack. That was no surprise to me. I expected Josh Juris to go down to Adirondack. You mentioned Sven Berchi earlier. I had him last week pegged to my opening day roster. But I think you're right. If we look at where the roster's shaking down, he's going to be a third, fourth line guy here and get between seven and ten minutes a night, where in the AHL he's probably going to be a first line guy. I think talking to Flames fans, the biggest thing everybody thinks is that these are like permanent reassignments, and they're not. These are just reassignments for opening day. I'm of the belief that Sven's going to be the first call up this year. I think as soon as there's a spot for him, he'll be back here. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. And, and it, I think he can one, win himself a full-time spot here. Yeah, and one of the things that I noticed about him was that he was playing a more defensively sound game, especially compared to last year. And one of the problems he seemed to have is that he it took away from his offensive game. I think he only had one point in the preseason. And because of that, that's probably why he got sent down. Plus, when you have a guy like Johnny Goudreau, who just looked amazing every time he was out there, it's kind of hard to give Berchi the spot over Goudreau when they're both fighting for the same spot. For sure. And, you know, I think that, as weird it is to say, because Sven is only 22... Um, I think he's being looked at as one of the elder statesmen in the AHL, and I think sending him down there is going to provide some leadership for a lot of the young players that are going to be starting their career there this year. Yeah, and if you look around the league for good developmental teams like Detroit and Tampa Bay, 
most of their good prospects have had two years or more in the AHL, and Berchi will be entering his third professional season this year. If you look at a guy like, say, Andre Palat, he had two full seasons in the AHL for Tampa before getting recalled last year and obviously was fairly good for them. Similarly with uh, Gustav Nyquist with Detroit, he spent two-plus years in the AHL when he was ready, and that time spent down there allows you to work on things to make your overall game more complete. It, so it's not a bad thing that Sven's going down. He just has to work on all the little things to become a complete player. Yeah, and, I, think, I think it's a tool, and he has to utilize the opportunities being given and look at it as an opportunity to make his game better in a learning environment. Yeah, and that's why having him down there playing 20 minutes is a good thing because he will get the opportunity to figure out all the little details that he needs to work on and getting the right balance between being an offensive player and a defensive player. It it can't hurt, and... Like, a lot of Flames fans I know have been rather pissed off that, frankly, that only Goudreau is going to be in the NHL to start the year in a rebuild. But if you look at our roster, like, all the guys have one or no years of professional experience with the, the exception of Berchi and Reinhardt. So, like, not a lot of experience with our kids, even though they are good. So, it's hard to manage that as well as going through a rebuild. I agree. I think, and it's interesting, the players that you compared um, Sven to, I think part of the difference there in my eyes is the Flames are a rebuilding team. And I think fans here expect on a rebuilding team that young players just sort of automatically make the team. And well, he was drafted in the first round. She should make the team. I think too, the fact that he did play in Calgary, for his first year, also kind of set that precedent. But I totally agree with you. I think as much as I thought he was ready for the opening day roster, and I still do, I think that sending him down isn't going to hurt him. I don't think it's saying that his career is done or anything like that. If he stays down there all year, it's another story. But I'm not convinced that A, Goudreau is going to be here all year, and B, Sven's going to be in Adirondack all year. Yeah, and... It, like, if Berchi goes down to the AHL and totally sucks and is terrible down there, well, you're not going to gift him a spot and you reevaluate his NHL potential after that. But if he goes down with the right mindset of working on his game to become that NHL top six forward that he looks like he should become, then that's a good thing. Do you think that the Flames will throw a letter on him in Adirondack as a show of confidence in him still, and also because he is, as you said, him and Reinhardt are the two kind of elder statesmen there? It wouldn't be a bad idea. Would I, you put it on a C or an A if you were making I a decision? I would probably put an A, and a guy like uh, John Ramage or one of the more veteran guys like Corey Potter would be the captain, possibly. Yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. I also think that based on what we saw last year with some, let's say, immature behavior with Sven, I'm not sure that he's perhaps the leader that they want to wear the C. But I think it would be a great idea to give him a letter and give him that show of support. I think you're right. Potter could be a great guy to uh, wear a letter mm -hmm. and wear the C. Um, Max Reinhardt, I don't think, is ready for the C yet. But yeah, I think Potter... Potter's probably the right guy and probably isn't going to get recalled right away where there's going to be an issue there. The players know, like, in the room who's the right guy for that. We're kind of outsiders on that aspect. So. Yeah, I don't even know if the players know yet. They're all brand new. I think this one might end up being a coach's decision. Well, now that training camp is over, now that Berchi, Ordeo, and uh, Juris have been sent back to Adirondack, um, any final thoughts you have about the camp? The players that are left, anything? Uh, I was just encouraged by the level of competition and play by the younger players, and a lot of them did make 
a good statement for being NHL caliber talents. Like, the separation between the lesser veteran guys and the prospects was very minimal. Uh, that's probably why a lot of people are annoyed that guys like Berchi didn't get spots. It's just one of those things where you have too many veteran guys under contract, and we are rebuilding, so it's not like those spots won't come available. And at least, at least there's qualified guys that are ready to come up if and when injuries do occur. So, one of the things that I noticed, um, as as I'm going through my notes here and just thinking about the training camp in general. I think that this year the Flames had an interesting training camp because I found that in the past there's been a lot of guys that you don't really know who they are. They haven't really created a um, an identity for themselves, I guess. They're just walk-on guy number, you know, whatever their jersey number is. And I found that this year there was a lot of distinct personalities on the ice. I was able to watch guys and really get a yeah, sense of who they I were. Agree which I thought was really interesting. Guys were trying to make an identity for themselves right away. And it wasn't just going to see, like I went to a couple exhibition games, and it wasn't just, oh, there's random walk-on guy. Like You knew these guys, and you could tell, for the most part, tell them all apart, and really kind of get into who they are, as a not necessarily as a person or anything like that, but the style of player they are. And I think because there's open spots, guys were trying to differentiate themselves to show the coaches that they should get those spots. Yeah, it's not like you're dealing with career AHL guy number one, two, and three type of thing. No, or even in the past where, say, the Flames didn't have spots. So it's like, well, why you know go through all this when I know I'm not going to make the team anyways? Mm -hmm. I know what so you I mean. Think, I think the fact that they had enough open spots and the fact that guys like Josh Juris were stepping up I think might have motivated other people to really say, okay, this is the kind of player I want to be. You know, they might look around and see the Goudreau and the Bennett and say, this spot is full on this roster. So I'm going to try this other way of showing myself off. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, vying for those uh, third and fourth line spots as well. Yeah, vying for the third and fourth line spots, and I think also showing the Flames what kind of player they want to be when they go to Adirondack. Mm-hmm. So I was happy with that. Um, when I look around this this team, I think that the Flames, I don't think we can say yet they have one of the better development programs because we don't know how the program's going to look. But I think it's a very strong AHL team this year. And I think that anytime you get an injury, this team is, the Flames have had injury history of being really screwed by injuries. They tend to get decimated hard and heavy at some point every season, it seems. And I think... We have enough guys this year that we can confidently bring a ton of guys up to fill those holes and still not have a gaping hole in the AHL like we did last year. Yeah, and there look to be about 8 or 10 guys that if they needed to be called upon in the NHL, they wouldn't look out of place. No. So that flexibility will definitely help moving forward. And if you remember last year, they called up a ton of guys to deal with injuries, and then the AHL team, which looked like it was going to go far in the playoffs really ran into a hard run there because they ran out of players and i think that this year it's going to be a hard for the flames to pick who they want to bring up which is good but i think there's enough talent there that they're not going to run into that issue again yeah and when you add guys like arnold gaudreau uh van brabrandt uh augustino that weren't in the organization per se like they were in college like, adding those guys on top of what we already had just adds to the depth. I'm just counting the players here on the uh, Adirondack roster, and this is either going to be a very deep roster, or I think the Flames are going to have to get creative with where they put some of these guys. We might see the Colorado ECHL team have some players put down there and have them be strong, or we might see a ton of loans happening, because there's some of these guys I can't see the Flames wanting to play third and fourth line minutes in the A. Yeah, and that's a good thing. And it is. With the amount of quality draft picks that the Flames have had over the last three, four years, it, it's starting to flesh out the whole s organization, really. And that's just a byproduct of that will be having a really deep and skilled AHL team. 
unfortunately, it's those players haven't quite had enough experience in order to transition into the NHL yet, but that will be coming soon. Yeah, and I mean, that's what, that's what this is all about. And I think anyone that says all the kids need to be on the roster all the time isn't really looking at the bigger picture. They're looking at, yeah, that'd be entertaining, that'd be a good media story, but... Look at Edmonton, to... really. Look at Edmonton and how screwed up their team is. It, they rushed a lot of their guys, and it screwed over quite a lot of them. It, well, that's it. And and what's the rush? Yeah, we're going to be a bottom five team, likely, whether we have the Sven Berchies up or not. So what difference does it make? We're not going to make the playoffs. And arguably, if there's one year to stink, it's this year. Yeah, especially with the draft this year. Well, that's that's why, yeah, because there's two great players in the draft this year that everybody's looking forward to. Well, not only that, there's like four or five guys that are actually quite good. So it sucks as, you know, watching the Flames this year because we will be terrible and there's not going to be a ton of excitement but we were terrible last year too and everybody rallied around this team it, it'll be frustrating especially because like all the players that people want to see will be in upstate new york but that's what will be good for those players moving forward so if they get the seasoning that they need in the farm like next year and the year after you'll start seeing the guys like bear chief furland reinhardt those guys actually sticking in the nhl instead of heading back down there yeah and it's it's interesting you mentioned that everybody that players or that uh, people want to see are going to be on the farm i know for myself i'm already looking at the at the adirondack schedule and figuring out games i want to watch and i know a lot of the ahl games are online so I wouldn't be surprised if they get a lot more viewers than they usually would, because I think there's going to be a lot of Calgary fans that want to follow Adirondack more closely than perhaps they did with Abbotsford. Yeah. Do you know if there's a like a game center type thing for the AHL, or do they just stream on their website? Um, I'm not sure. I watched a couple games last year on TV, um, and I know that they were trying some different things last year, but... I'm not 100% sure. I think it's just streamed on the website. Uh. If you're not in, like, I think they do it by regions. They check your IP address, and if you're not in the area, then I think you can see it online. Uh. But I'm not sure. It would be a good thing for us to, we'll check into it, and we'll let people know next week. Yeah, because I know that there will be a lot of people that will be interested in that kind of thing, so. So we're... We're, we're the day before uh, training camp, or not before training camp, we're the day after training camp or the day before rosters have to be in. The uh, Flames have to submit their opening day rosters to the league by Tuesday afternoon. And right now, the Flames sit at two goalies, I believe nine defensemen. That might be eight after Watherspoon got sent. Well, Watherspoon got sent down and Diaz got brought up, so that probably cancel each other out. And 16 forwards for 27 players. They need to get themselves down to 23 for opening day. Right now, Granlin is still on the roster, but he's injured. Bennett is still on the roster, but he's injured. And Backlund's on the roster, so he's injured. So that gets us pretty close. Um, that gets us a 24. So we need one more guy to be sent down, I guess. Who do you think is going to be sent back down to make that last roster spot? Well, I think Corey Potter is still on the roster, so I would assume he would go down. And is he hurt, though? I think so. Okay, so he'd just be if, IR'd then. Yeah, if not, like if he's not hurt, he'll probably be one of the first people tomorrow to go on waivers. Okay, so yeah, I'm pretty sure Potter's hurt. Um, Matt and I were looking today. We're trying to find like an official NHL injury list, IR list. There doesn't seem to be one. But according to the ESPN list that we're looking at, um, Potter's not listed there, but that doesn't mean he's not hurt. But yeah, I agree with you. I think he'll probably be waived and sent down. Um, now that they have a defenseman in Diaz, I don't think there's any reason in keeping Potter here. Now, the interesting thing is Goudreau is still on the roster, a guy that I don't think either of us expected to make the opening day roster here. Do you, do you think he stays here? No, he. I think he made the team because he's just that good. Like, I, I knew he was good 
It, it's one of those things. Every shift that he was out on the ice, he was doing something noticeable and he was very dangerous pretty much every time he was out there. He, I don't see any benefit now to sending him to the AHL. Like, I thought he might have some conditioning issues that, you know, not playing all the time like he is expected to now. So I think he, talent-wise, he has shown enough where he sticks. I agree with you. I think he earned his spot on the team, which is what we wanted to see this year. We want to see somebody earn their spot there. I think he is right now on the roster because Backlund's out, so it gives us a hole to fill. Well, but Backlund I think... returned uh, in the last game against the Jets. So... Is he back? Yeah. Because he's uh, he practiced Friday. Okay, so he's back then. So either way, I think he's on the roster now. I I think, like you said, the conditioning and stuff, I'm not so much worried about the conditioning with uh, Goudreau. I'm worried about his size and his ability to perhaps play in this league, and I think this is where they're going to test him out. I mean, he doesn't have to clear waivers. If he can jump in against NHL quality players, because he's played a lot against rookies and training camp you know, level guys, if he can jump in against full-time NHLers and still look as good, yeah, I'd keep him here. If not, it's easy to send him back down. Exactly. Like, if he, after the 20-game mark, if he's struggling really bad, send him down. Yeah. If not, like, if he's holding his own... Why not keep him up? He's not going to benefit. Like, if he's performing in the NHL, he's not going to benefit from being in the AHL. So, if he's doing great, just let him rip. Yeah, and I, I think that I agree that he earned his way here. I mean, he was one of the most impressive guys to watch um, during the preseason. But I think that, let's just say I don't think that he's got a full-time roster spot yet. I think he's got an opening day spot. But I think there's still work to be done to secure that as a full-time spot. Mm-hmm. We'll see. We'll see. Hopefully he hopefully he impresses us. Yeah. And worst case scenario is he goes back to the AHL and plays down there for a bit and works on being an impact player both at home and on the road. Because most of his points came at home when the Flames had good matchups. So we'll see. The other player that is interesting, and Matt and I were trying to find information before we started tonight, is Bennett is injured. And we are trying to find out for sure if Bennett is hurt at the beginning of the season, if the Flames can still keep him here to play nine games when he's healthy, or if he has to be healthy at the beginning of the year for that. Yeah, I don't know. I think you have to play in nine actual games, not just be up here for nine games. But Yeah, well, that's ah. what I wasn't sure. Like, if he's hurt for the first 20, could they play him in nine after that once he's... Well, the thing is, is that, uh, like, if you got hurt, per se, like, right at the beginning of the season and you're out for three months, you're not able to be sent down until your injury heals. Right. So, I don't know, like, because, like, that would obviously surpass the nine game mark, and I don't see why that would count as a contract year type of thing. I think that might be different with Junior, though, because if you're... I know that's true at the AHL, but I think you can still be reassigned to Junior if you're not signed to a contract. Oh, no. I'm meaning, like, it burning a year off the contract oh, yeah. because of that. I don't know, though. So if anybody knows, let us know. Uh, tweet us or let us know on Facebook, because we'd be... We're both really curious as to what the situation with Bennett's going to be this year. And if he's healthy and ready to go for game one i think they might keep him up for a few games just to give him a taste i agree with you and i think it would make for a great um home opener celebration to have bennett skate out on the ice with the rest of the team i think that he's the face of the franchise right now and why not yeah it, it give him a a taste uh, let him know exactly what he's got to put up with and then send him back to kingston afterwards and, you know, it'd make a great story to put him and Goudreau on a line for the first couple games this year. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And let them rip and see. Because the Flames will have something to look forward to with those two guys. Well, that's it. And even if it's just, a, okay, here's nine games. We played him with Goudreau. Now he's going away. Now you know what to look forward to next year. It's... A cool thing for the fans to have that. Especially with the somewhat disappointing news of having guys like uh, Berchi and all that not being here. 
Well, Matt, we've spent a lot of time over the past couple weeks talking about the young players, the prospects in the organization. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the veterans, some of the NHL regulars, if you will, on this roster? Um, we've had a lot of interesting years from some of these guys lately. Is there any any of the veterans on this team that you think are really going to impress us this year? I think uh, probably uh, Mark Giordano and Yuri Kudler will be the front runners for best veteran players. Somewhat similar to how they were last year. Uh, from what I've seen of uh, the new guys like Setaguchi and Mason Raymond, I wasn't exactly blown away by either of them. They're solid players, but nothing to write home about. How many preseason games did Mason Raymond play in? I think one or two. Okay, I remember him in one. I wasn't sure. Yeah. It, he was injured for most of it, but he yeah. didn't really stand out as being super awesome. But he wasn't bad either. And same with Setaguchi. They were just kind of there. I, I agree with you about Gio. I think that we saw a really good year from Gio last year that he's going to build on. Um, I agree with you about Hoodler. I disagree with Raymond. I think that Raymond has some approved this year. Um, when he played in Vancouver, he was kind of second fiddle to the Twins, as anybody would be. And I don't think he necessarily got the chance to shine. And I think that in a market like Calgary, especially when he's, for all intents and purposes, replacing Camilleri, I think that he's going to at least get the opportunity to show us what he's made of. Maybe he won't be able to live up to it, but I think we might see a really good year from Mason Raymond this year. He got uh, 45 points in 82 games last year with the Leaves. So if he can do better than that, I mean, a 50-point score for the Flames... I think we've, we've got some there if he can get to that, you know, 45 to 50. Well, the thing is, is that Toronto had a lot more offensive weapons than Calgary does. So getting 45 points on the Leafs is a little bit easier than getting 45 here. True. So, Well, look at uh, Sean Monaghan last year. Like He had a hard time getting over the 30-point mark, and that was due large point part to playing with guys like Joel Colborn who are all right but they're not you know they're not guys like Yuri Hoodler or some you know like Tange or other guys who are skilled so it'll be interesting to see if uh, Mason Raymond can create his own offense instead of playing second fiddle as you were saying yeah, and I, I just I think that Mason Raymond has shown last year, even, you're right, Toronto has more offensive upside than Calgary does, but I think he's shown he can be an offensive force, and I think here he's going to be looked at as one of the top guys, so it'll be sink or swim for him to see if he can do it or not. Yeah, and if he can perform and get 45, 50 points, then definitely look at re-signing him for a year or two. Even if he can get it, you know, between, I think if he can even get to 40 yeah, and he'd he'd have the year that we need him to have. Exactly, and if he doesn't, then you look for next year's Mason Raymond, so to speak. Well, we got him for a couple of years, don't we? No, I think it was just a one year. Was it okay? The other guy I'm hoping that we get a good year from this year because we started to see him turn around last year was Matt Stajan. Um, Stajan got a hard time for a number of years here as a Flames fan, and. Last year, he had 63 games and 33 points, so he was almost a point every other game. I think that, depending on who they put Stajan on a line with this year, especially if he's playing with, say, Goudreau as one of our number one centers, I think that we're going to see, maybe not points-wise, because I think Stajan's a better kind of defensive centerman, but I think we're going to see Matt Stajan as one of the most solid guys in the forward ranks this year. Well, Matt Stajan's a bit of a weird player in that he tends to play to the level of his line mates. And, like, when he was with Toronto, he was getting 50 to 60 points a year, and he was playing with solid offensive players. And when he was having difficulties here, he was playing on the third and fourth lines, playing with somewhat mediocre offensive guys. So if he gets the opportunity to play with a guy like Goudreau or Bennett or whomever that's an offensive weapon, 
then I think he could put up 40 to 50 points. It just it depends on who he's playing with. Yeah, and again, I think that just like we were talking about earlier, um, I think that he's going to be looked at as a leader here, and I think that he really started to emerge as a leader at the end of last year after he and his wife lost their child. It seemed like after that, we heard more about him in the dressing room, more about him talking with media, so I think... The team's going to try and launch him to be more of a um, a leader this year, and that might even help his game, just making him feel like he's in a different position within the team. Mm-hmm. I agree. Anybody you're, you're expecting perhaps not so good a year from? Anyone that's going to have a down year maybe from where they were last year? Well, I'm not expecting a lot from guys like Setaguchi, uh, Brandon Bullig, that those type of guys. I, I don't see a lot from them at least in the preseason thus far we'll see how it goes in the regular season because you know that's a different ball game but but i think that brandon bowling was brought in with certain expectations and as much as we might not expect a lot from him i think he's gonna meet the expectations he was brought in under yeah i just i'm not really a fan of his from what i've watched but uh, things change I think, you know, like even look at a guy like McGratton, he's come here and it took him a while to become as popular as he was. But I mean, if you'd say that, well, I think that, you know, McGratton's going to have a bad year most years. Offensively, you're probably correct, but he's brought in to play a role. And I think Bo League's playing the role Westgarth had last year, which was backup enforcer. And I think he's going to do okay in that role. Yeah. I can agree with you there. It's it's not like we were going to be disappointed if he doesn't get 10 points. He had 14 last year. If he can get 14 points, I'd be very happy. Um, Guys that I think might have a disappointing year, perhaps, from where they were last year. Um, David Jones, I don't think, is going to have a great year. What did he do last year? He He played 48 games and got 17 points. I think Jones is very quickly going to be... Um, limited nice time this year, so I don't even think he'll get 48 games. I agree with you, Devin Setaguchi, but again, I think he will meet the expectations he's brought in under as a guy on a one-year 700,000. I'm not expecting much. One guy that I will be curious to see how he does is Joel Colborn. Um, he had a good year last year with 28 points. I think that with the roster the way it is this year, and Colborn probably transitioning out of center, which he did better at last year, I don't know that Colborn is going to do perhaps as well as he did last year. I think he was given a lot more ice time and chances last year because he was kind of the young upcomer. And I think he might just kind of get lost in the lineup, if that makes sense. Yeah, it with him, it, he's probably the one player that I could see going either way. Like, either he'll develop into a quality top six-ish forward or he'll just stink up the joint. And knowing what you have it to predict right now, it's kind of hard to put your finger on him. Yeah. I also, as much as I don't want to put his name out there as a disappointment, I think this is going to be an interesting year for Curtis Glencross. I think yes. just like Colborn, he's either going to have a great year or he's going to have a really bad year. And I think we're going to find out you know, within the first 30 games, which way he's going to go. Mm. And it'll determine whether or not we even attempt to keep him beyond this year. If he comes in and is somewhat mediocre, uh, which he was at points last year, then I think you just kind of look to trade him at the deadline and nice knowing you. Or... Glenn, he only played 38 games last year and 40 the year before. So, I mean, he is a little bit injury prone. He's not playing a lot of hockey. But when he does play, he's a good player. Like, when he is playing, he's getting a lot of points for the team. But I just I don't know that he's going to be consistently in the lineup enough to, especially with the lineup that we see around him, to put up the points he needs to be where he would be in this lineup. Yeah. Plus, you also have to look at the fact that he is a left winger primarily. And you have guys like Goodrow and Berchi that are needing his roster spot. So unless he does something above and beyond to keep him, I don't know as if you would. 
Yeah, I mean, he's a fan favorite here, which I know I would kind of be sad if he left because I like him as a player when he does play well. But again, I think there may be more value with him this year, moving him now and not doing what a lot of people think perhaps we did with Iggy and keeping them longer because they're fan favorites. I think if we can get value from Glennie, this is the year to get rid of him. If, if we wait till next year, we might not get anything for him. Yeah, like I like Glenn Cross, but seeing where the roster is and the prospects where they're at, is that roster spot needed for a guy like him? Or would it be better served with a kid? I don't know. Well, not it, only that, but what can we get back for him that could help improve the team either now or in the future? I agree. And I think if you're going to move him, you almost have to do it before Christmas. Um, I don't know if there'd still be value for him at the deadline. We'll see. But he's one of the big guys here who's been here for a number of years that I wouldn't be surprised if he's not wearing a flaming C come closing day of the season. Yeah. Well, additionally, he would be very attractive to a bunch of other teams because he isn't getting paid very much. So if, especially if the Flames were to eat half of his salary, like that's only 1.25. So... You know, that would be extremely attractive to a bunch of teams. Yeah, well, he's on the last year of his contract. Um, that so he could be he could be a rental player at the deadline, but making $2.5 million in the last year, you're right. That's a contract that I think pretty much every team would be able to swallow. Mm-hmm. And again, if we need to, we'll eat some of that salary. we got lots of money to play with. But I think Glenn Cross is going to be an interesting player to watch this year for that reason. Oh, definitely. On the defensive side, anybody, we talked about Giordano, anybody that you think is going to do really well or really perhaps poorly this year? Well, I'm interested to see what uh, TJ Brody does. Like, does he emerge as a top pairing, like, really good exceptional guy? Or is he more of a 3-4 guy that's being pressed in the top line duty? Uh, That's a question that... We'll just need to wait and see. Beyond that, I could see a guy like Dennis Weidman struggling because he's still... His wrist, it it usually takes a year or so to recover from a year, wrist injury like that. And that was like at the midpoint last year, so he might struggle because of that. Beyond that, guys like Smead and Russell, they're there... I think this is a breakout year for Smead. I think Smead has never been looked at as a premier uh, defenseman in this league. And I think we saw him last year come into the Flames and play very well on our rebuilding team. And I think this is Smead's chance to show that he can do that if he can and really kind of cement himself as either a 1-2 guy or a, I guess a 1-2-3 guy or more of your 4-5-6 guy. Well, I look at him as basically being more or less what Corey Sarich was when Sarich first came to Calgary. A solid, physical, defensive-oriented defenseman. You might chip in a bit of offense, but more just your shutdown guy. And I think if he can establish himself as that going forward, then... Like, as we're coming out of the rebuild, that would be a very useful guy to have. For sure. And we got him for this year and two more after this at $3.5 million a year. Mm -hmm. So, I think he's actually making about what Sarich made here. Wasn't Sarich making like three, five, or 4? Yeah, something like that. A guy that I think, almost like we were talking about with Glenn Cross um, on the forward ranks, I think this is going to be a telling year for Chris Russell. Um, I think he impressed everybody last year with what he did for the Flames and how well he produced. He got 29 points last year in 68 games. If you look at his years before that, the best he's got was 23 with the Blue Jackets. But I think this is Russell's chance again to really show that, hey, I'm kind of top, top, let's say, four, five material. Or if he's going to be another guy who fades into obscurity as a six, seven guy in this league. Yeah. And I think this is Russell's chance this year um, on a two-year deal. He's got this year and next year 2.6 each to really show the Flames what he's got and other teams around the league what he's got too. He's being paid more than Brody. So I think that, you know, if you look at it that way, he's got to deliver this year. Yeah, and 
it will be a good way to see whether or not, like, he can effectively replace Dennis Weidman. Yeah. And if he can, then that's great. And if not, then he's going to basically be remembered more as a... Um, a flash in the pan, six defensemen who had a hot ear. Yeah, like a Marc-Andre Bergeron type guy. Yeah. Um, I know that Weidman's got a lot of flack from especially Flames fans online through calgarypuck.com and other places. I personally like Weidman. I think he plays a role and he plays it well. I think he might be a little bit overpaid this year, but I mean his whole contract, but that's not an issue for us right now. Do you think there's a need to move Weidman this year? Well, it's one of those things. If you get a good return for Dennis Weidman, like even if you have to eat half of the contract, why not? Like, it's one of those things where you can't really be tied down with any particular veteran guy. No, but would you be actively shopping him around, trying to maybe take a deal that's lesser to get him out of here? No. Like, if, uh, like, say, like, Russell exceeds expectations and effectively replaces what Weidman brings, then why not look at... For half the price, yeah. Yeah then why not look at moving Weidman and see if you can't get, like, a good right winger or something somewhere that you're lacking in the prospect pool. If not, oh well. Like, you, either way, it's a good thing. Like, uh, there's no real definitive, oh, we must do it this way or that way. No. And I think that sometimes he gets an unfair shake from fans. Um if we were in a rebuild, I don't think he would be worth the money he has or have the spot in the defensive ranks that he has. But being where this team's going to be this year in the standings, I think Weidman's perfectly fine playing for this team and having the role that the Flames have given him. Yeah, exactly. Like it, the, It's not a bad thing that he's here or necessarily a good thing that he's here. Like He's just there. It's not like he's Anders Eriksson. It's not like he's got to get off the ice because he can't play the game he's a good hockey player you don't make five and a half million if you're not exactly it, it, it's one of those spots where it doesn't really matter either way so he's doing a good job for what he's being paid interesting notes um the flames right now have 14 forwards uh they've committed 25.58 million to their forwards this year according to capgeek.com Eight defensemen currently sitting at $21.81 million. That includes uh, Corey Potter and Rafael Diaz, which I guess they're both 700000 so one of them will cancel the other out. And two goaltenders um, at $7.25 million committed for the year. So if you're wondering how the Flames are breaking that down, um, they've pretty much they're spent almost the same on forwards and defense, which is interesting because you have more forwards, but we have a lot more younger players making less money at forward. So a lot of our big dollars are committed on the blue line. And that's fine. Yeah, totally fine. And as far as goaltenders, we talked a lot about them this year. Um, last week and the week before, I think that Ramo, again, has to have a breakout season this year. It's a contract year. I think if he doesn't and Hiller wins, I still think Hiller's going to get the majority of the starts, but if Hiller wins, say, 60 games this year in the Flames net, I think Ramo is going to be done as a more than $1 million goaltender in this league. I think he'll end up being a, either a backup or go back to Europe next year because this is his last year with the Flames right now. Yeah, if Ramo doesn't show anything, like even if he's only as good as he was last year, then I don't think that's going to be quite enough because there are quite a lot of good goaltenders in the league. And I think the fact they brought in Hiller sends him that message, too. Yeah. Like, if he plays as he did in the last month of the season, all year, then there will be a spot for him. And I for think, sure. I think we'll even keep him at that rate, even with Hiller. It just... It's another one of those things where you have to wait and see, because uh, the goaltenders especially... Who knows what you're going to get any day yeah. of the week. <laughs> and Ordeo is still a couple of years, in my mind, away from being ready. So I think even if Ramo doesn't come back, we, we have Hiller next year, and we can... I mean, there's a number of backup goaltenders. We can find somebody. Well, 
at that rate, I think you, if you don't keep Rommel beyond this year, I think Ordeo takes that spot and see what he has. I think that depends has. how Hiller plays. True. And that does depend in quite a large part due to Hiller as well. Yeah. So Yeah, I mean, if Hiller has a rotten year this year, I think definitely you bring Ordeo up. If Hiller has a great year and looks like the Jonas Hiller of the past, I don't want to bring Ordeo up next year to back him up. Yeah, well, you also have to look at uh, what Ordeo wants, because I'm sure that like he's getting a little tired of being not given an opportunity. And like he wa- wasn't really given an opportunity when Kipper was here. Then he comes back to the North America after going overseas, and then Ramo and Barra get spots, and he kind of gets lost in the shuffle. So... And I mean, if you if you look at Ordeo last year too, he started the year in the ECHL and worked his way up. So even if I'm Flames management, I'm going to be telling him right now, show us you can play in the AHL for a year. Then we'll talk NHL. Mm-hmm. And if he has a stellar year again this year, then you look at having him come up. Because you also got to remember that McDonald and Gillies aren't far behind him. So, you know, you have to see what you have in Ordeo. Like, will he be an NHL starter? If not, then, of course, you do move on to Gillies and McDonald and anybody else that comes up. Yeah, or you could keep Ordeo in your your organization, as we've seen a number of times in the past, to be that solid backup. I mean, there's a lot of teams, if you look around, that have had the same backup for years because they're a good, solid backup. And even if he's not going to be a starter... I can see him being around this organization for a while if he wants to be here. Yeah, I agree. Um, just another interesting note looking at the team. Uh, a, fl- a player who was a flame last year, the Flames bought out last year, Shane O'Brien, uh, today was signed by the Panthers and placed on waivers to be assigned to the AHL. So another flame that, just like Butler we talked about last week, who was in the NHL last year and is now probably having to prove their job with a new organization. I'm not surprised. I'm surprised that Shane O'Brien even got signed. Well, O'Brien's not bad. It's just he, his attitude kind of sucks. Yeah, but I was expecting a player like that to go to Europe. I thought he could probably make a ton of money and play a featured role in a lower European league there as opposed to being in the AHL. Well, he he is uh, going to be in San Antonio. I do believe that is Florida's farm team. So We'll see. Who knows how long it'll last. Um, I doubt he's making anywhere near what he made with the Flames last year, so he could be a, bi- a bio-target. Yeah, it, he's probably going to make the league minimum and the AHL minimum. <laughs> there you go. So a league minimum is 500000 so he goes from, what, $4 million here to 500000 That kind of tells you. Didn't he only get paid two? Did he? Okay. Well, even two million to five hundred thousand—that's a big jump. Um, talking about players that we thought might look good or not good this year, I'm hoping that even though I think he's going to get limited time, based on what we've seen at camp, I think we have something to look forward to in Rafael Diaz. Yeah. I think again, he's a player that has to prove himself this year. I mean, he didn't get signed as a UFA; he had to go to camp and be invited a tryout agreement, which I have to imagine is hard on the ego as a guy who's, you know, an NHL player who's played in the NHL and made more than a million bucks. He looked good to me every time he was on the ice in the preseason, and as much as I'm not expecting him to get a ton of minutes this year, I think he's a guy that we're going to have a good year from because he has to have a good year um, to prove himself as an NHL or pass this year, and uh, I think he'll be a very steady number seven. Yeah, and if he can contribute anything on the offensive side of things, that'd be good. I'm not really expecting too much out of him just due to the fact that he is the number seven guy. He played six preseason games with the Flames and had four assists, so even if he can keep up that kind of a pace, that's pretty good. Yeah, and it, exactly. If he can contribute on the offensive side of things, then that's fine. Well, Matt, I think that's, uh, that's a bit about it for the big club. One thing I did want to touch on was some of the young Flames, the future Flames, who are doing some some good stuff already in the season. Um, a lot of names that we talked to at the rookie camp this year. Um, some interesting notes. Uh, Austin Carroll, who was the Flames' seventh-round pick this year, has been reassigned to the Victoria Royals. 
And he is second in the team in scoring with five points in four games. So quite a good start to Carroll's season, which is good to see, especially from a seventh round pick. And the guy that you and I both talked to at the rookie camp in July, Hunter Smith, was sent back to the Oshawa Generals and has five points in five games. So that's nice to see, at least this early, he's a point-per-game per player. And Mason McDonald has three wins and six starts with the Charlotte and Islanders of the QMJHL. So again, looking like he's going to be... I mean, if we... Obviously, we're still early, but if these guys are having this kind of pace now... That's very promising for what they're going to do this year and potentially what kind of players we have going forward. Yes, and anytime you have prospects that are putting stats on the board that are quality, that's at least a good start and something to keep track of moving forward. I don't want to say too much about this guy yet and make people think that you know I'm projecting this, but for Carroll being a seventh-round pick, to be over a point per game, for I mean, we're only four games in, but from to be second in team scoring with five points in four games to start the year, that's looking, I think, like a pretty promising start for a seventh round pick. Yeah. We might and have something like, there. It's one of those things where even if he only becomes a fourth liner down the road, that's a win. Well, you know, even if he's not a fourth liner, even if he's the next Josh Juris, the guy who, you know, comes in, is the dark horse, and has a great camp, and then can put up some big numbers in the AHL and be a, a solid AHL force, even if he's a career AHLer. I agree. Which I think Juris is. Um, I think Juris... Well, let's just talk about Juris because I brought him up. Had a great camp. One of the last cuts. Do you see Juris as one of the top guys in line to get a call up this year? I think he needs to prove that his training camp wasn't an aberration. But that's one of those things that we'll have to wait and see. If he continues to perform as he did, then I don't see why he wouldn't give him a call up at some point. It, he, the player he reminds me a lot of is somewhat like uh, Ben Street, who was a fairly good offensive player and an AHL leader. Whether he can surpass Street and become an, a full-time NHL player is still to be determined. But, you know, if he can be a 50-60 point guy in the AHL this year, then that would be good. Because you do need solid players that can work with prospects, even if they themselves can't quite make that leap from the A to the NHL. Yeah. I I mean, if you look at his past and what he's done in the past, um, I think that he is... Not one of the top guys to make it up. I think you're right. He has to prove that camp wasn't just a flash in the pan. I don't think he's going to get 50, 60 points, but even if he can put up 20 points as a line three, line three or line four guy, it's interesting you mentioned Ben Street. He reminds me of an old Flames prospect in Carson German, a guy who is a career AHLer, and I think... Juris might be in the same boat. He stayed around the organization for years because he was a solid AHLer. And I think that might be what we have with Juris. Yeah, and you can never tell with prospects who's going to turn out. So he might be just one of the few guys that actually does figure it all out and becomes a good player like a guy like P.A. Parento. You don't know. And, and, and sometimes just being around good talent makes everybody better. And if you look at the roster that's going to be featured in Adirondack this year, he may have a good year just because he's got great line mates and he's with a very talented team too. Exactly. And it that's part of the fun of a rebuild is that you don't know who's going to be the that guy that steps up. Yeah, for sure. And and that's part of the cool thing, I think, of being even the coach in Adirondack is you almost get to play. You you don't have a, a, you know established lines or guys in really established roles. I think you can play with guys in different roles. You can play with guys in different lines. I think it's going to be cool to watch those games because I think we're going to get to see a mixture of a whole bunch of guys playing a whole bunch of different roles on a whole bunch of different lines down there. Oh, yeah. It'll be fun. And next next week, after we see what the opening day lineups look like for the whole league, uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion as to if we think that Adirondack might even have a shot at the Calder Cup this year, um, once we see how everyone's opening day roster turns out. 
We'll also talk about some stories next week that we can watch this year. Um, things that we might we see as some storylines for this year. And we will look at the first couple games uh, that the Flames play, I guess, for the regular season. Can you believe that the regular season is 48 hours away? I'm definitely looking forward to it, that's it's for gonna sure. Be, it's going to be a fun season. And yes, the team's not going to do well this year, but I'm really looking forward to everything that goes on with this team this year. I think it's going to be a lot of fun for the Sea of Red to follow this team again. Well, it's exciting to see players like Goudreau and Bennett and Berchi and all that, even if they're not in Calgary, to see actual skilled prospects that we drafted and we're developing. Like, that's kind of a foreign thing for the the last 30 years (laughs) of Flames hockey, so it's nice. And I think this year, too, the fans now know a lot more of the prospects. And I think we're almost going to have more of an emotional attachment to these guys. Like, I can see if Sven makes the Flames roster, there being this huge fan following around that. And I think that the Flames, like I said, I think we know these prospects better. They've made themselves individuals during camp. And I think that we're going to kind of follow these guys and have our favorites among prospects, which is kind of weird for Flames fans because generally, I mean, we have no idea who these guys are because there haven't been a lot of them. But I think that you're going to find that some of these guys have really interesting fan followings around them this year when they get called up. Yeah, there's lots to look forward to, that's for sure. Well, Matt, uh, go Flames go, and let's enjoy the opening game against Vancouver. You think we can win it? Well, I'm hoping that they pound those Canucks. (laughs) Let's hope so. Maybe we can get them early and get our what might be our only win against the Canucks this year. We'll see. Yeah. We'll talk to you next week, Matt. Take care. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.